Okay, so we already did cerebrospinal fluid, and now we need to move to synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is joint fluid. So it's the fluid that is found in joints. Um, there is a synovial cavity surrounding the joints that's enclosed. The, it has a, a fibrous capsule on the outside. Um, the synoviocytes are on this little, they make up this little synovial membrane here. And that synovial membrane, um, those synoviocytes are the ones that make the, the fluid that's in there. Um, now, the fluid is not just plain water. It actually has hyaluronic acid in it, or hyaluronic, that makes it more... Um, that makes it thicker. It's like a slimy consistency. It's it's a little bit thicker than water. It's so it's a little um, kind of like dish detergent, only not as thick. Okay, and it's it needs to be a little bit thicker so that it provides a lubrication. If you have enough fluid in there, um, it helps to absorb impacts on the joints. Um, it will help to provide nutrition, um, amino acids, and, and sugars, and things that primarily amino acids uh, that are needed to make the proteins that are in there. Okay, so what is the function of this this fluid? Um, it helps to lubricate. It helps to um, provide a buffer between the bones, and it provides nucle nutrients for um, the different the cartilages that are on the ends of the articular surfaces of the bones. Okay, how is it formed? It is an ultrafiltrate. So basically, the plasma is pushed across the synovial membrane. Um, and there are no really high molecular weight molecules. The only higher molecular weight molecule that you'll get is the hyaluronic acid that is actually provided by or produced by the synoviocytes uh, in that synovial membrane. So, what are we looking at? So why are we looking at joint fluid? Well, there's lots of different reasons why we might look at joint fluid. Um, and there's, you know, one, of course, is we need to find out <clears throat> what's going on with the joint. Okay. So lots of people end up with joint pain and as we get older, they get more and more achy and move less. Um, so we have different types of arthritis. Okay, so there's non-inflammatory arthritis, there's osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis, where, you know, the, the cartilages are, are, are wearing away and the bones are becoming calcified and they're, they're not moving as easily. Um, so non-inflammatory arthritis. There are inflammatory arthritis like lupus and um, rheumatoid arthritis. Any type of immunological uh, response or, or something that causes the, the joints to swell and, and become stiff, um, even in the case of Lyme disease, okay, that can be a problem. Um, in that inflammatory, it might not be um, so much like a... a autoimmune disorder or, or bacterial infection, this could actually be um, crystal induced. So people get goot, goot, gout and pseudo gout um, commonly. So there are a lot of people who suffer from gout, um, my father being one of them. So guess what I'll end up with when I get older. Um, so gout can cause lots of joint pain. Um, because there are crystals in that fluid now, and it, now it's not just simple fluid movement, you know, the joint, 
the bones moving in the fluid now they've got little granules in that fluid that it's like getting a piece of sand in your eye and you don't have you know you can't take it out um so yeah it's gonna that's gonna be kind of interesting too um lyme disease is a bacterial infection the problem is that the inflammatory arthritis that comes from lyme disease is not is not because the bacteria is still is there because the bacteria may no longer be there we may have cured the lyme disease and you still have the inflammation and the, and the arthritis to go with it so just realize that the bacteria may not be in there okay now this one the septic arthritis this is where you actually have microbes in your joint cavity okay and that and one of the more common um etiologic agents for this would be neisseria gonorrhea believe it or not people get gonorrhea in their joints the last one would be hemorrhagic typically um <clears throat> you have trauma or you have a a malignancy a tumor that causes um damage inside of the capsule that can cause hemorrhaging okay Co people who have coagulation deficiencies or coagulation disorders some of them may actually end up with with this as well but for the most part these are your four classifications you have non-inflammatory inflammatory septic or hemorrhagic and you have to classify the type of arthritis by what you see in the fluid and what's going on with the patient okay so me I'm lucky I'm so lucky I have this degenerative joint disorder I have my knee my left knee is bone on bone I have no cartilage well I have a spot the size of a bottle cap that has no cartilage but I've already have damage to both of the bones so I I am a candidate for a knee replacement i just am putting it off as long as possible okay so how do we get the fluid well we actually stick a needle in the joint fluid joint cavity and we withdraw fluid using a syringe so it's called arthrocentesis now the knee fluid in a normal knee has about three and a half mls now if you pay attention when you are looking at how many how much fluid three and a half mls really is it's not a lot of fluid okay so one of the things that happens is people get dehydrated and they have achy joints and they can't figure out why they're so achy and I, my husband does this all the time i'm like drink more water as soon as he gets rehydrated and drinks the the water than he needs he's like yeah they feel so much better i'm like yeah how about that because you didn't have any joint fluid in there okay um typically the fluid will not clot unless there's something else going on in there so a normal fluid won't clot it's nice and and liquidy okay um it's still has it's not pure water so it's not going to be 100 percent liquided it's going to have a little consistency to it but um only when in the case of a disease will the clot will the fluid actually clot so <clears throat> once they remove the fluid in the syringe um we will put the fluid or the fluid gets put into a heparinized um vial typically it's sodium heparin for micro um liquid edta we don't want powder because we won't don't want crystals to be showing up that don't need to be there okay um 
Sodium fluoride, if you're doing a glucose analysis, that doesn't always happen on joint fluids, just so I'm going to say that now. Um, and then if you're going to do other tests, you can either use the, the heparinized um, fluid or you can use just plain the way that it is and, and just put it in a plain serum tube, no serum separator, just a serum tube. Um, and of course you want to test all fluids ASAP um, so that the cells don't lice and the crystals don't have weird changes to them. So it's important that you do all fluids as a stat or ASAP. And so you need to work it in among other stats if you're getting slammed with stats. Okay. A stat typically has somewhere around a, an hour turnaround time. An ASCP has somewhere around a two hour turnaround time. So we understand it if it takes a little longer than an hour, but it better not take more than two hours. Okay. Oh, look at this. See this big thing up at the top that says no, this slide. Hmm. I wonder why. Um, guess what you're going to be asked about on the test. Okay. Normal appearance of synovial fluid. It's a pale yellow color. It looks like egg white. Okay. So it is an extremely pale yellow color. Okay. Um, if it's more yellow than pale yellow, or if it has a green tinge to it, um, then we may be talking about deeper yellow color with an inflammatory or non-inflammatory arthritis. So we have arthritis going on, or if it has a green tinge to it, then you could actually have an infection in there. Okay. If it is cloudy, okay hazy you might have some white cells in there or you may have some may have picked up some of the um synovial membrane so you may have some cells in there um, or there could be some fibrin if it was hemorrhagic arthritis or if you have a traumatic tap then you're going to see red of course with a traumatic tap you're going to see the decreasing amount of red in the different tubes so depending on how they drew it which tube way they put in which tube they filled first from the syringe um you will see a variance of red in the tubes if um there are crystals present you may see a milky appearance a lot of time it doesn't it's not that terrible okay so you see a little bit of turbidity you don't really it's not real milky um and then you look at it under the microscope and you see that there are in fact crystals present okay so viscous viscosity hyaluronic acid is like the oil of your of your joints okay you need the hyaluronic acid in there for joint mobility. Um, arthritis decreases the amount of hyaluronic acid that is produced. And so, um, the joints don't move quite as easily as they could or should. So, one of the things that we do um is we check the viscosity of the fluid so from a syringe okay we drop a drop of fluid from the syringe and it won't just drop as we would like a drop of water drops immediately from the end this one's going to string out before it drops um, and so when we say that we're looking for a four to six centimeter string okay two to three inches of stringing before it actually drops off of the needle that means that hyaluronic acid is good we have enough in there 
Okay. There is also a ropes test, also known as the mucin mucin clot test, um, and you add fluid to acetic acid and it forms a clot. If it forms a good solid clot, then it's good. Um, if it has a soft clot, then that's fair. Um, and a clot that's like disintegrating, that's really not well formed, that is what we call a friable clot. That's um, low viscosity, and then if it doesn't clot at all, it's poor. Okay. Because we get fluids in the lab sometimes that we don't know what the heck they are, but we know it's a fluid because it came in a syringe and we have no, you know, whatever. Um, you can actually use acetic acid as acetic acid to it to determine that it is synovial fluid because the other ones won't clot. Um, so now here's the thing. If you don't have poor viscosity because you don't have enough hyaluronic acid in there, how will you know that it's synovial fluid? Well, you don't really, but um, <laughs> you can try to identify it by using acetic acid if you have an unknown fluid that comes into the laboratory. Okay. Cell counts. Um, you're going to count your white cells, but don't use your white cell unipets because your unipets have acetic acid in them to um, dissolve or lyse the red cells. So you're going to just use regular normal saline. Um, if you want, you can add a little methylene blue to it so that you can see the white cells a little bit better. Uh, if you have a really thick fluid that's very viscous, um, you might have to add a little hyaluronidase to it to be able to um, dilute it out so that it's not as thick. And you're going to perform these cell counts the same way you do cerebrospinal fluid. You're going to use the Neubauer chambers. You're going to count your 10 big cells or big squares. Um, and you're going to get a count. Okay. Normally, you're going to see less than 200 white cells per microliter. In the case of an infection, an active infection, you can get counts that are super high, like 100,000 white count whites per microliter. That's an excessive amount. In that, you're going to see extremely turbid fluids. <clears throat> and then you're going to take some of that fluid and you're going to put it into the cytocentrifuge, which you haven't seen that yet. We're getting there though. With the cytocentrifuge, you will then um, make a smear. Stain it, and you have to do a differential. The normal cells that you're going to see are monos. You'll see monos, you'll see synoviocytes. You might see a few neutrophils, but you shouldn't see a whole lot of lymphocytes. Unless the person has non-inflammatory arthritis. So this is a totally different picture from what hematology is. It's a totally different picture from what your cerebrospinal fluid is. Because we're going to see a lot of mana here. Okay. Um, and then very, very, very little lymphs, and maybe we'll see a few neutrophils. Now, <clears throat> that being said, we look up here and we go, oh, look, 
mono, 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 lymph, lymph. Um, looks like a neutrophil, neutrophil, neutrophil. Ne there's a whole lot of neutrophils in here. Well, so same thing here. Whole lot of neutrophils in here. But if you look at this one, do you see this? This guy has ingested microbes in there. Okay. So these are bacterial infections right here. I can tell you that. These two. This looks more like the normal. Okay. So, and this is um, a different kind of a, a, a cell. These are the strange looking LE cells. <clears throat> um, you might see some EOs. Um, you might see some writer cells, which basically they're very vacuolated monos. Um, and look, it, this one looks like it has ingested a neutrophil. So this is a writer cell right here. Um, the ragocytes, I don't have any, sorry. Lipid droplets, so you might see lipids in there because, you know, from crush injuries and things like that where they've broken a lot of bone and now the lipid from the the yellow marrow is coming into the, the capsa, capsule. Um, hemocytorin, of course, you guys know that hemocytorin granules uh, happen with an iron overload and things like that, so that that could be an issue. You have to be able to identify the crystals that are present. Okay. If you see crystals, you have to tell them whether they're gout crystals or uric acid crystal, you know, uric acid crystals, gout crystals, pseudo gout crystals. Um, and so there is a, a way to do that. I'll talk about that in a bit. So lots of, lots and lots of different things that can happen here. It's not a pH thing at this point, okay? Um, in gout, you're going to see monosodium urate crystals or MSU crystals. Then in pseudo gout, you're going to see calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals, okay? These crystals do not look the same in the fluids of the, of the joints as they do, like, in urine. So you're going to see urate crystals or uric acid crystals, and they're going to look a whole lot different in a, in a joint fluid than they do in urine. So don't be looking for those um, rhomboid shaped crystals. All right. So gout typically is um, a lot of uric acid. Uh, the kidneys aren't getting rid of it. You're taking a lot of purine high foods foods rich in purines like pork and seafood and shellfish. Um, mostly shellfish, not so much just plain fish. Um, maybe your body doesn't utilize the purines appropriately or sometimes with the chemotherapy for blood disorders then we, we end up destroying a lot of the DNA and we end up with a lot of proteins or the purines in there um, that can cause the same issue, gout. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> that's this one. The calcium pyrophosphate dihydrates typically are found in the degenerative arthritis. Okay. Um, so we may see, or in other disorders that can cause your calcium levels to be elevated. So, hydroxyapatite. What are what is hydroxyapatite? Anybody know? Um, hydroxyapatite is the calcium phosphate mineral that we put on the collagen when we're building bone. Okay, that's the mineralization of the bone. So you may see hydroxyapatite crystals in the fluid because the cartilage or articular surfaces have broken down and you're seeing little breakdowns of the bone in there. Um, you might see some cholesterol crystals um, which actually look like the ones that we see in urine and they have those little notch corners and they will 
polarize. Um, those are typically found in those autoimmune disorders. You might see corticosteroid crystals, which are flat, weird plates. Um, and those are usually because, you know, people get shots in their knee to help control the pain and the swelling. Um, calcium oxalate, again, they will look similar to what we see in urines. Um, and we might find those on renal dialysis patients because they're not taking all of it out through the kidneys. And then artifacts. So you have to be able to recognize starch and dust and, and the powdered anticoagulants, even though you shouldn't be seeing powdered anticoagulants because you're supposed to put them in liquid EDTA. So look at this as soon as you possibly can. Okay, so the fluids, what you're going to look at is, you know, you're going to look under um, low and high power, look at a wet prep, see what you see. If you can see crystals, then you might be able to see the crystals on your diff. So like this little rectangular piece is inside of this neutrophil and here's another skinny rectangular piece of a crystal in here and here's another one here okay so you need to be aware when you're doing your differential you may also see crystals in the cells okay when we're seeing this okay um, we see a whole lot of crystals out here. You see all these little hash marks. Those are crystals. This will be on a low power. All right. <clears throat> so you need to be looking at this as, as soon as you possibly can. And then we'll figure out how to do this. So um, we look under polarized light and we look under compensated polarized light for that wet prep. And if we're looking at those monosodium urate crystals, they're going to show in cytoplasm. They're going to stick through these things. Okay. Um, so you might see them inside the cells. You might see them outside the cells. They might be going through the cells. Okay. The calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals they're going to be more rhomboid or square shaped. So those are those more chunky, big, fat crystals. Okay. Um, these are typically seen in neutrophils because usually the MSU crystals will, will break those vacuoles in the neutrophils. Okay. So both of these will polarize light. Okay. The MSU is extremely birefringent and is much brighter than the CC, CPBDs, okay, the calcium pyrophosphates. So again, sticking through the cytoplasm, very bright light, right? Um, and then you're going to confirm the identification of it using a compensated polarized filter. And so what does a compensated polarized filter do or polarized light? There's a compensator that we put between the crystal and the analyzer that produces a red background. Okay. So the background is not black. It's not white anymore. Okay. And it separates the, the light into slow and fast moving, um, waves. Okay. The crystals get aligned on the slow vibration and then it'll allow different colors to show at different spots. Okay. I know this sounds really stupid, right? but you'll see it in a second. Okay. Undercompensated light. Okay. Notice how you have all these things and you got these blue going this way and these yellows going this way, right? And it's undercompensated light. So what we do is when we try to, remember I said we line up the crystals with the slow vibrations, right? Align your crystals with the slow vibrations. 
So once we have them aligned with the slow vibrations, we're looking at these guys, or we're looking at these guys, um, then <clears throat> um, the MSUs will be parallel to the long axis, okay, um, and align with slow vibration that way. And then when the fast light is stopped or no longer there, it'll produce a nice yellow color. Okay. The CPPDs typically run perpendicular to the long axis um, and produce a blue color. Right. So depending on which way you flip your switch as to whether you have the, the slow or the, the fast going on and what's happening, um, depends on what color your crystals are. Okay. So when you get to the facility and they show you how to do this, so if they explain it to you properly, then you will be very, you'll be in good shape because then they'll be like, okay, well, this is on the fast. And if it's blue on fast, then it's CPBD. And if it, and when you flip it this way, then it's slow. And if it turns yellow on slow, then it's an MSU crystal, right? Really easy. So, um, but I can't show you that because it's not here. All right. So this guy has a little bit of both, right? right. Um, so typically any values that we have in these synovial fluids are very similar to what we would see in plasma. Uh, the most frequently tested analyte would be glucose and then the difference would not be the difference typically is within 10 milligrams per deciliter of what the plasma glucose level was. So if you have a plasma glucose of 102, it should fall, be, it, it should not be any lower than 92. Okay. And you're supposed to draw your plasma level at the same time that they're collecting the um, synovial fluid. And that doesn't always seem happen. But if it is, if the glucose is way lower, then typically we're looking at an inflammatory arthritis or septic arthritis. Okay. Protein, the normal is less than three grams. Okay. So the, if you remember the cerebrospinal fluids, that was in milligrams, right? This is actually in grams. So this is very similar to the values that we see in, in blood. Okay, um, but with inflammatory or even hemorrhagic, because hemorrhagic is going to have blood um, proteins and stuff in there, hemoglobin, whatnot, uh, it will increase. Okay, the uric acid, um, you can actually run a uric acid on the fluid if need be. Um, typically, they'll look at the serum uric acid. Um, but crystals, the actual crystals, whether we have crystals there or in what crystals they are, is actually a lot better to diagnose gout with. So, <clears throat> you see this? Do you see the things that are highlighted in, in different colors? Those are extremely important. This is going to be, you know, this just basically gives you a wrap up of what I've already told you. Okay, so it's actually a really good slide to know. Um, for the microbiology department, okay, we are going to do a gram stain on this. So we're going to get a cytocentrifuge slide and we're going to gram stain it. We're going to culture it. Um, and all of the cultures must include chocolate auger because... Neisseria gonorrhea and Haemophilus influenza will not grow on blood auger plates. So you have to have the chocolate auger there as well. 
or you will never be able to recover Haemophilus influenza or Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay. Um, we see a lot of staph infections, um, some streps, like strep group C's and F's and G's sometimes. Um, if the patient history warrants it, so if they are immunosuppressed, have some long-term history, or they've had previously had problems with fungal infections and TB, then we will do TB infection, TB cultures or fungal cultures, but we don't normally run those on every fluid. <clears throat> so again, we're going to be looking at gram stain and cultures, which include chocolate auger. Okay. Serologies, yep, we're going to do serologies. We're going to do RA tests on this. I already know. Um, that's that's a big thing. Uh, we do RA tests um, or tests for lupus antibodies to find out what these what what is going on. All right, so we're looking for lupus erythrocytosis or erythromosis. Um, or rheumatoid arthritis, and we can do serology tests to determine whether or not you've got lupus or whether you've got rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Lyme disease. To test for Lyme disease, you would have to look for antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi, and Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete that is transmitted through that tick bite into your body that would cause the in the Lyme disease. Okay. Arthritis is um, a sequela. It's something that follows infection by Borrelia burgdorferi in a lot of different instances. Okay. Um, if we wanted to check to see what how bad someone's inflammation is what's going on um, we may we may do a c-reactive protein uh, that's not terribly common we usually do crps for a lot of different other different reasons or um, if we're looking for whether or not it's hemorrhagic arthritis we might do a fibrinogen test but not frequently done on joint fluids, just saying. <clears throat>